Okay, away we go. Uh, thank you for joining us for our first senior design presentation. Our very first group of the whole core is the ATCM, Automated Tool Changing Machine. So go ahead, guys, take it away, 25 minutes. Thanks, Dr. Hart. Uh, so I guess we can start by introducing the team. My name is Alex Reed, and I'm the resident mechanical engineer of the team. And just to kind of give you a brief overview of why I'm interested in this project, which you'll learn more about later, is I've been working on manufacturing products and 3D printers since like basically as long as I can remember. So this is really something that speaks to me. My name is Jack Haig, and I'm a computer science student here. And um, I've always had a desire to build a complete uh, software application that interfaces with the machine. I'm Will Bush. I'm a computer science student, just like Jack. And I've always had a big interest in developing um, web applications. And I've also had a big interest in 3D printers, even though I haven't had too much of a background in them. I'm Andrew Ramirez. I'm a computer engineering student here. Uh, and I've had a lot of fun working in the past with different embedded controllers and circuits, especially related to 3D printing. And so now we can introduce the project itself. So what is our project? Our project uh, seeks to combine two different types of rapid prototyping devices. Uh, namely 3D printers and CNC machines. And the reason we wanted to do this was um, so that the device itself takes up less space while still maintaining the rapid prototyping capabilities of both machines. Um, along with that, we also wanted to include our own custom software so that hobbyists can have an easier introduction into using the machine, the machine uh, while uh, still being able to get all of their work done. And we had three main goals when we were keeping our project in mind. Um, the first was a small form factor. Um, each of the two standalone machines are a pretty similar size, about the size of a standard desktop, com desktop computer. So we wanted our design to be a similar size as well. We wanted to keep a low cost. Uh, the overall goal for the team was to keep the cost below $1,000 for us, um, as well as keep the um, final product uh, under around $500, which is what a CNC machine is. Um, and 3D printer is also about $250. Um, lastly, we wanted to make it as accessible as possible. And um, to do this, we wanted to use as many uh, popular um, software uh, software um, design components as, as we could, as well as uh, get as many automated features as we could to reduce the amount of steps required by the user. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of our project deliverables. So obviously our device needs to be able to maintain its 3D printing functionality and everything that comes along with that. It must be able to autonomously switch between any of the tool heads attached, whether that be the 3D printing head or the CNC milling head. It obviously must hold at the very least an FDM hot end and a milling head, and it must be able of, must be capable of milling both wood and plastics with a stretch for the team of aluminum as well. Our device ideally will fit within a workshop or desktop size, somewhat around the size of a standard desktop printer, and our goal is to have a working prototype completed by the end of quarter three. And now on to our target users. Uh, so our target users are mainly hobbyists and start level uh, research and development. And users in these categories can typically uh, experience the following challenges where they have a small workspace, uh, limited funding, as well as manufacturing experience. Uh, and they still need to be able to manufacture parts with both 3D printing and milling. Um, and they also generally require some level of future scalability. Yeah, and so that kind of brings us to the existing solutions that we found early on in our research of this project. Uh, these are the three that we had identified were closest to what we were kind of trying to achieve. Um, so first off is E3D. They're a company that does kind of an autonomous tool changing motion system, but their project is mainly geared towards 3D printers. There's not really anything set up around CNC machines. Um, and so we wanted to kind of look at what they were doing, but not focus too much on just only 3D printers, kind of bringing in that CNC aspect. They don't really do that all too much. Enscript is another really cool technology, but it's a very expensive technology, mainly geared toward PCB design. And so the build size of an Enscript machine is very, very small to kind of mimic a PCB, which you'll see later in this presentation is something that we had to develop for the project. Um, and so their system was also very large. It was kind of a more industrial solution than we were aiming for with our like hobbyist rapid prototyping, small scale stuff. And finally, the Exchange was a really cool system that's used to kind of retrofit a 3D printer. Um, and what the Exchange does is 
basically the user has to manually cha change in and out a 3D printer head to a CNC head to whatever the user may want. But that's a manual operation that the user would have to stop the printer and manually take the thing off and put the thing back on. And that was something that we as a team wanted to eliminate from the whole process, was making this whole thing autonomous and making sure the user doesn't have to stick their hand into the machine. So moving forward into kind of the preliminary aspect of what we wanted to accomplish. We had identified three separate 3D printer architectures that we wanted to look into, uh, those being Gantry style, Delta style, and like Cartesian slash Prusa style. If you're familiar with 3D printers, you'll kind of see what we mean there. Um, and the main differences between those is Gantry has two axes on one motion system and then another axis. Um, versus uh, Cartesian is another XYZ coordinate system, but it uses each individual. Um, each axis has an individual motion system attached. And finally is a Delta system, which has three vertical linear motions that kind of, it's, it's a very weird concept to wrap your head around. And there's, as you'll see later in the presentation, we kind of leaned away from them for our application, uh, as well as the tool change itself. So this is the kind of meat and bones of our uh, project is actually changing the tool. And we'd identified um, electromagnets as well as, I'll pass this to our audience, Dr. Hart. Um, One minute, audience. So the way that works is there's a collet that you can kind of pull off and it'll, here, may, may I show the camera too? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so you can pull this tab here and yeah, with a little bit of convincing, this will come out. And so we had identified this as another potential solution for tool changing is kind of a ball locking system. And I'll let you check that out again. Um, so those are just two of the main, like, main aspects that we wanted to explore when we were building this project. And so some concept art then moving forward, we had a bunch of initial designs, which Andrew will sure. take over. So essentially on the your left here, you can see some of our very rough models of the initial tool change concepts. On the top here, you can see an electromagnetic based design with an electro electromagnet in the center, surrounded by three locating pins. On the bottom, we used more of a dovetail style of locating. Uh, and you can see later in the presentation, we really went back and forth between these two methodologies for the location of the tool head to the tool change mechanism. Um, but as you can see, some very uh, rough sketches that we came up with at the very beginning. <laughs> and so that brings us to actually making these decisions. What type of 3D printer architecture did we want to base ours off of? How did we want to pull the tools? And so three of our main kind of components, and I, we didn't describe one of them because it was just kind of a more basic motion system. Uh, that being using a, like a lead screw versus a belt system. Um, we had identified a bunch of pros and cons and kind of criteria that we had evaluated them based on, based on all of our previous experience using manufacturing techniques. And they kind of relied on myself as the man, like man, mechanical engineer having used a lot of these systems before, but as well as ease of programmability for our controls team as well. Um, and so we decided on initially using a gantry system with a, an electromagnet tool holder and using lead screws to drive the whole system instead of using belts. And we had identified those solutions based on, it, this would allow us to have the most precise machine to do CNC operations as well as locating the tool properly. Um, and then moving forward, we kind of, after we had made those decisions, we moved forward with some preliminary maths. Um, and we doing after doing some more research, we found some cutting force calculations, which is a very, uh, necessary part of CNC milling. And so to identify which motor we were going to use once we had determined, <laughs> basically once we had sketched out the rest of the, the device, we wanted we needed to figure out what guts were going inside of it. And this was one of the things that we needed to figure out. Um, after a lot of math and a lot of working things out, we came to the conclusion that an RS-775 uh, DC motor, which I'll show you right here, this is kind of a sample size, this would be suitable to mill um, wood and nylon, it would be a suitable motor to drive that forward. Um, and yeah, so then moving forward again, we can, sure. <laughs> so after determining the force that we would be experiencing on the tool heads themselves, we set up to investigate a little more about our electromagnetic solution. So after determining that a 50 pounds holding force electromagnet would be suitable to hold the CNC motor and obviously the 3D printing tool head, we needed to determine exactly what size steel block to put into the receiving tool heads to ensure that the magnet had full force when connecting the mechanism to the tool heads themselves, but also not too much weight on the 
tool heads so that they would start to deal with some effects from gravity. So as you can see on the bottom here, we use a spring scale um, and a pretty rudimentary testing method uh, to determine the force on a set of three different sized steel blocks. And we came to the conclusion that a quarter inch steel block would be the best for optimizing the both weight to the force uh, for the electromagnet. Yeah, and so as you can see here, our initial CAD design on your left of the screen, um, that's what we had come up with preliminarily. As you can see, the yellow lines there indicate lead screws. Those are like our motion system. Um, and on the right, you can see um, after some discussions of how we were actually going to build this thing during the very late stages of quarter one into quarter two, we were talking with our advisor, Dr. Patterson, who had a lot of 3D printer parts kind of laying around. And as you can see in front of us today, this large top piece, I won't include um, the legs that it's standing on, was donated to us from our advisor. And basically we said, go ahead and figure out how to make what you use in CAD a reality with all this componentry. Um, so we were really grateful for that because basically free stuff, right? <laughs> Who can complain about a free 3D printer architecture? Um, and we'll kind of get into the pros and cons and the differences between what we had in CAD versus what you see in front of you for this version one. Um, so like I said, there's a core X, Y kind of principle here that gantry being moving in X and Y directions. Um, and you can kind of see that this will move left to right and back and forward along these rails. Um, sadly, what we were provided has belts. You can't really see it in the camera, but the system that we had on hand uses belts. So that's already kind of one, <laughs> one of our decisions down the drain just based on what we had on hand. Um, but the basic working principle that we were thinking of is this system would move left or right based on like position one, position two, position three, and then I'll get to that in a moment why this was kind of not the best solution for us. That was not planned, but <laughs> but very funny. Hopefully this is some comedic relief. Basically, this would then move forward to grab whatever tool we wanted at that moment. <laughs> Please, next slide. <laughs> So we had designed this 321 locating principle for the tool change device itself. So now if you could imagine this big brick 3D printer head isn't on there, but instead we would have one of these guys, rather one of, one of these guys, and this would mount the actual tool to it. And what happens is these three pegs that you can see here will first align. You can see there's kind of a little bit of wobble there, but as it moves further into the housing, there's a lot less wobble there. Um, so these three, these first three pins will locate a plane that this can kind of rotate about. And then two of those three planes can then also locate it so it can't shift up and down. And finally, with use of the electromagnet, we'll actually hold it in place against the other component. So it kind of sandwiches it and fully locates the tool to the part that's mounted on the gantry as it's moving around. And so that's kind of the working principle that we had identified. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we get into some pros and cons. One of them being, this is a fairly unstable system. It kind of relies on a lot of compression force to get these rods to actually stay in place. There was a lot of instability there. It's a very heavy system. I'm not sure if the thud came across across camera as well as it did in person. But a lot of old components had to be replaced. This was a system that was made in the 1990s that we were kind of working with and trying to retrofit to make work with our designs versus what you saw in the CAD earlier, something that we could make ourselves and kind of know it's know it's inside and out from the start. Um, yeah, we can move forward on to kind of how we were, what, what our controls team was doing at this point in time. Yeah, so taking a little bit of a breather and moving to software. <laughs> um, we defined some requirements for our custom slicer, um, very broad requirements. Um, and the first of which is the user has to be able to see the model in the software, uh, as well as generate G-code for CNC and 3D print jobs. And then we also wanted to make sure that we defined in the requirements that the UI needs to be familiar to users that are switching over from, say, the Cura slicer. Um, and I guess also on, um, while we're speaking about slicers, uh, we need to understand what G-code is. And basically, G code is any or is code that can be interpreted by uh, the device as a command. Uh, and we can see an example line of G code here. Uh, and you can see that um, at the beginning of the line, uh, it just indicates the type of command with G one, 
uh, the movement speeds indicated in there, along with uh, Cartesian coordinates, as well as in the case of a 3D printing job, the extrusion speed. Uh, in the case of a CNC job, that might be something like spindle speed. And then, so now we move a little bit towards um, the math behind the slicer. So this is um, an STL file or an ASCII STL file. And basically all STL files do is they define triangles, the triangles that make up a 3D model, uh, as well as their normal values. So you can tell which way they are facing. And we can use that to find the um, 2D planar views uh, when we're slicing the object. Uh, and then the general flow for a slicer is that you have your STL file, uh, you slice it into layers of specified thickness, and then within those layers you make infill uh, of a specified percentage usually. Uh, and then from there you can uh, generate a toolpath and from there you get your gene code. And then this is just some of the math that goes into uh, depending on where the triangles lie on your sliced plane. Um, how you can calculate the different endpoints. All right, and now for the requirements for the server and application. Um, so for starters, in order to get a 3D printer to be able to print something off of your computer, you're going to need to initialize a web server, and then um, you have to be able to connect your laptop to that web server um, via an IP address and the Wi-Fi that both of the systems are on. Um, the 3D printer has to be able to display the machine state. Um, it, has, it also has to be able to define um, specs about the file um, and like the specs about the print job, like um, how far it is along and what percentage it is and the estimated time remaining. Um, there's also some UI requirements that we wanted to hit too, such as connection strength, ping, um, and different uh, specs about the control of the actual hot end of the 3D printer as well as uh, graphs for the temperatures of the hot end and the bed. Um, and we also wanted to do a modular design. So the great news for us is that this has actually already been done um, with Octoprint. Um, and a little bit about Octoprint is that it's a operating system for 3D printers. Um, and it provides the server as well as a web application that is pictured on, on the right hand side of the screen. Um, it's also a very popular and very easy to use um, system, and there's a ton of documentation on it, so it's, it's very user friendly to new users. Um, and so the initial plan uh, for, uh, for the software side was to download um, the open source program and make it our own by giving it uh, uh, um, different uh, abilities like importing Jack Slicer into it and um, other things like that. Um, and a little uh, minimal viable product for the server was to actually um, connect Octoprint to a dry board, which is our acting um, our acting 3D printer environment. So on the left, you can see the dry board, which is a 3D printer without all of the uh, all of the stands on it and whatnot. It still has the motors and the server and whatnot. Um, the screen and the keyboard are so we can communicate with the actual server. And then lastly, we have my laptop, which is connected to the 3D printer server, um, the Octoprint. Yeah, and so that kind of wraps up where the controls team was at the point that we had finished build on this version one product. And as you can see on screen, and what we're about to show you now is the mechanical version two of our project. Um, and so as you can see, it's quite a bit more stable. Um, I mean, I can wrap this thing back and forth and the uh, print head does not <laughs> fall off. But basically the principle of operation here is basically the same with an additional actuator. We decided to use an Ender 3, which is one of the most common 3D printers that we found on campus. Uh, actually, two of our members have had them in their apartment. That one's mine. So we developed off of stuff that we already had. The idea just didn't come forward to use one of our own personal devices, and we started working on uh, stuff that we had had in the lab on hand versus what we had in our house on hand. Um, next slide, please. So, working principle is similar, um, and so, but, but we had an additional actuator. So, as you can see by my demonstration here, um, we've got some V slot rollers, and we haven't assembled it on there yet, but there is a lead screw that will be attached to this 
8020 arm here with all of our tool ends on it. One, two, three, that will move forward. And depending on where this X axis of the ender is, will come forward and mate with either a CNC or a 3D printer head or whatever you may want. Um, and so, like I said, that tool changing working principle is essentially the same. We just had to add this rectangular piece here. It's basically a clip rack sort of thing to hold on on the frame side, whatever tool might need to, might need, might need to be held. And so I'll show you again, this is kind of what I was showing you earlier, that three position or that three peg locating system. And I'll hand that to Dr. Hart if you would like to play around with it. That was actually 3D printed on one of their other 3D printers that we have just because we're in 3D printers like that. <laughs> um, but as you can see, there's still that hole for the uh, electromagnet. I just wanted to make clear that it's the same system that we're using just on a different platform. Um, and kind of like I tried to make clear in those last two slides, um, there's improvements over this chassis, such as it being much more rock steady solid of a base. Um, it uses V-slot material as its chassis. So any type of prototyping we wanted to do, we had access to V and T-slot in the uh, MSOE machine shop. And so it allowed us to, with the same look and feel, redesign the whole system and kind of add on to an ender. Easy to modify and the 3D printer itself actually worked. Like all the motors there have worked. And as soon as we disassembled it, it 30 minutes prior, I pulled the print off the bed. So we know it works. Um, however, there's some drawbacks. We did require an additional actuator. That's really the main drawback there is that we had that additional motor power consumption for it. Um, a few smaller issues with it. We it required a small redesign of the tool holding assembly, but we were planning on refining that anyway. So it's kind of it was kind of a win-win for all of us on the team. So one of the main challenges that we faced when dealing with our tool chaining mechanism is how we transfer power and data from the machine frame to each of the individual tool heads. So to solve that, so that problem, we came up with this solution, which is a set of two small little control boards that essentially act as the power translation from the machine frame to the device. They use a set of these spring-loaded pogo pins and on contact with each other will transfer all the power over so that whenever a new tool head is swapped onto the machine, it will already have all the power and the data it needs to run. And the benefit of this board specifically is that it has the ability to be expandable. Um, all of these are standard wiring connectors, so any device that uses the same power and ground as our CNC motor or the 3D printing hot end, theoretically will be able to work just fine with this power distribution system. And another challenge we faced was the control board of the printer itself. So on the left here, the screen board you can see is the original board for the Ender 3 printer which is what this was before the modifications. And on the right here, this blue board is our current working control board, the Duet 6 hc board. Now, the biggest difference between these two is the expandability and the amount of wiring connectors. The Ender 3 only has four main strepper motors, which is not enough to run the extra actuator that our new design required. The Duet 6 hc board has six of these, so it's one more than we would need. It also has the advantage of more spots for different sensors, different wires, all these things as well as the ability to run our own web server right on the board. Uh, real quickly, just wanted to go over what the software was doing at this point. Uh, so right now we're actively developing our user interface for our application, uh, which is actually one of the, the latter steps. Um, and we just wanted to more clearly define the requirements for it. Uh, and we really chose the Cura Slicer to model our UI design after, uh, and that's because it's widely used. Um, and it's proven to work very well. Um, and uh, we also wanted to leave room for more expandability. And then as far as testing, we're currently testing our, our 3D print or 3D printer G code um, by uh, plugging it back into Cura actually and looking at the tool path that, um, that Cura uh, says that the G code will take. So. And uh, lastly, for the volume two updates uh, for this, <clears throat> excuse me, for the server and application. So one pivot that we made was deciding to use a plugin instead of actually editing the code base of Octoprint. And um, the benefits that a plugin brings is um, it brings along a lot of support and documentation. Um, it also brings along software updates because if we had just edited Octoprint instead of the plugin. Um, we wouldn't have been able to get any um, any more Octoprint updates. And, um, and Octoprint is a ton different than it was five years ago, and I'm assuming in five years it'll be a ton different as well. And then this helps reduce code maintenance.
Um, and then so the visual design of the plugin is on the right. Um, so in Octoprint's UI, there is the temperature control G code viewer um, pane. And um, the plan is to put a slicer pane all the way to the right of it and put Jack slicer right into the Octoprint application. Yeah, and so just to finish up with our project, here's the vision of our future timeline. Uh, we're planning on working into quarter three into, to finish out the school year on this project. And as you can see with the purple, that's a majority of our four team members' timelines is a lot of testing. So first, we're going to redesign a few things. As you can see, there's still some things to be fixed on that device, but we want to basically finish that really quick and test everything and make sure we have all the functionality that we need. And to finish this off, this is our team's budget as it stands now. As stated previously, we're aiming for under $1,000. As you can see here, we're just under 700. And thanks to a grant from MSRE's Great Institute of $500, this leaves less than $200 for the total cost to our team itself. And we'd be happy to take any questions that you may have at this time. All right, great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, we'll open questions to uh, the general audience. Um, I will also have questions. So. Um, Feel free if you have questions online, otherwise I'm just going to go ahead with my <laughs> questions. Uh, <laughs> so um, first off, good job. I always love 3D printing. That's you know, interesting to me, definitely. Um, first question is, uh, if you have a negative, like a cavity on your piece, how is your software, your slicer, et cetera, going to determine whether you're going to just not print that material or whether you will print it and mill it? Um, currently, we had defined in our project that we were only going to do CNC and 3D printing jobs separately. I see. Um, we did look at the possibility of doing that, but we determined that within the, the one year time scope, it wasn't exactly feasible. Sure. But yeah. Okay. Um, reasonable. So you, you also discussed at the very beginning about a motor selection. Um, I think that you have a separate motor for your um, like lead screws and you're driving of the gantry versus a motor that you have for the CNC itself, right? Correct. Um, Sorry, that we should have been more clear about that. Yeah, we're using stepper motors, uh, NEMA 17s. Okay, motor. got it. Um, and then another follow-on question to that is, how are you determining where you are in space with your printer? Do you have encoders on the back of the motors that you're utilizing to determine your position and you have limit switches that set your zero? Things um, like that, like well, how so are you handling yeah, that? It uses the same kind of basic operating principles in Ender. Currently, um, limit switches on forward and back to home, the X and okay. C, Y. Um, and we're planning on adding limit switches to the front and back of that secondary actuator okay. that we added. Great. You have one here from your advisor. You want to jump in here, Nate? Yeah, I've got more than one. <laughs> uh, he, has, he has more than one. Okay. I'm going to try to pump the volume, but I might have to repeat you, okay? Yeah, yeah, no problem. So the first one is you calculated the cutting force uh, for the motor that you're going to use for milling. Uh, but what did you do to calculate uh, what you need for the stepper motors in terms of allowing the mill to actually move through the material laterally? Because you, yeah, yeah. you need to worry about that cutting force for that movement as well. Right, true. So. We're planning on using a fairly low feed rate right now. Um, I know as the feed rate increases, you need an increasingly more powerful motor. Um, and currently, there was another portion of that math there that I neglected to mention that does kind of take into account the lead screw, which is driving that forward. Uh, and so I guess that was more focused on version one when we were planning on driving the X and Y motion with lead screws. Um, so th that kind of told us how much power, <laughs> how much power output that that motor needed. Um, so currently, with revision two, we need to re go through those calculations to see it drive through, uh, see what force that motor needs to drive through material. Um, and hopefully, we're hoping that we don't need to upgrade those motors, but we do have uh, some plans in place if we do need to upgrade those stepper motors. All right, so the, the second one is um, the changer that you have seen and you showed everybody is 3D printed, but have you have you looked at all at the variation that you're going to see from one copy to another um, in terms of where the tool head is going to be positioned? Do you mean like, um, if, I, if I mean, like where these three positions of each individual like separate tool is on the rack is that your question no like if it picks one up 
and then uses it and then picks up a different one and uses it. Um, the variation in those prints are going to cause likely going to cause that like the tool heads to not be in the exact same position. Have oh, you excellent. have you measured that at all or uh, what's your plan for dealing with that? Uh, I'll say that's not something that I as the mechanic, like the mechanic, the mechanical person of this have, have considered. I don't know, Jack. If you, yeah, so that's something that we're glad you brought bring up these questions, especially since we're moving forward on this. That's not something that we've taken into consideration at this moment. You're smiling. <laughs> they can't they can't really see you very well, man. Don't worry. But your smirks and things, I'll relay them as best I can. <laughs> if I may, I, I kind of have an idea if I may kind of have this interplay with you here. Um, using just limit switches on the X and Y, just kind of rehome that X gantry there. So it knows where zero is again. Would that solve? No, your it's problem? more of a. It's more of a. The the print heads are even if you just use print heads, right? You're not going to assemble them in the exact same way, and they're not going to get 3D printed in the exact same way because the material, like the maybe the diameter on the filament's different, um, and there's those small variations are going to cause the positioning of the nozzle to be different for each copy that you make. You and mean so, more mechanically of the like of the framework of the system then, not positioning as it's moving. Um, um, yeah, more of like the the error that you're going to get from all those assembled devices that are not exact copies of each other. Okay, you mean like a tolerance stack up then, almost like in the assembly. Yeah, like, in, in a way, because it's it's even more complex than that though. <laughs> Okay, yeah. I, I know that as you being our advisor, gratefully, thank you. Um, could we like, could I work with you in the future, like quarter three on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so sorry about my kids in the background. Um, so <laughs> with uh, the power board, um, how are you going to deal with the the swapping out the tool heads? And I guess you you kind of already answered this you're not going to try to do multiple tools in the same print, right? So essentially, I mean, I guess, so we have the ability to, in the future, if we do use multiple tool heads, to continue using the same board in the same system. Uh, and that would be more of a firmware uh, tech change we'd have to make. So essentially, we would have to make sure the printer knows exactly what tool heads it is swapping to, so that it can change the parameters of the power and the data that it is sending across that board. Um, Based off of the preliminary research we've done, it will use the same power and ground levels, so that shouldn't really change much at all. The only real difference between, for example, a CNC and a 3D printer is the um, there's two extra wiring headers on that board. They may be used, they may not be used, depending on the tool head that's actually attached at that time. Um, but that's just a simple thing in the firmware to turn those off, as long as the printer knows exactly what's connected to it in one. So then on the on the um, software side, at least the user interface and slicer, how how are you going to deal with the injection of additional like G code commands for changing tools and um, whether it's just like per print or um, per, per CNC mill or the combination of going back and forth between layers? Um, currently, uh, it's kind of still up in the air, <laughs> to be honest. Um, currently, our main focus was just to get the Cura slicer actually working in, since we're using the Cura's backend, um, we wanted to get that actually working. And we actually just last week verified that that is working. <laughs> working. So um, that's actually my for break. <laughs> <laughs> He's nodding. <laughs> All right, and then one last one for the web interface. How are you going to handle communication between the Unity WebGL stuff or WebAssembly and Octoprint? Um, do you want to go? Can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, so how are how are you going to handle the communication? Because you you need some communication between the interface and Octoprint, if I understood what you're trying to achieve, right? Um, right. Do you know Do you know what you're going to try to use to communicate between those two? 
Um, that's also my homework over break. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the user interface that I had in the um, slides is actually from um, a, a plugin that somebody has already developed that is um, on Octoprint's actual site for plugins. And it's it already um, solved the issue of embedding a slicer into Octoprint. Um, so the goal was to rip that one out and then put Jax in as well. And um, I think that's when I'll run into the uh, the communication issue between the interface and, and the actual the engine. Yeah, I mean, because at some point you'll need like they need to specify something and it needs to get sent to the machine, right? And so mm -hmm. um, I. The, the reason I ask is because I know Unity and the web publishing does not work incredibly well with web sockets. And so you might start doing that reading uh, sooner rather than later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, I think that concludes uh, that concludes it for me. We'll, we'll, we'll call it here. Uh, I have a couple more, but we'll do it off, off offline. So, um, thanks again, everybody, for joining. Uh, I'll stop the recording now. and. Um, We'll take you out the hot seat. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Right. I'll I'll give you my notes too, Nate, when I'm when I'm all done here. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Bye, guys. <laughs>